Micah was a prophet for turbulent times. That's why we called our series imaginatively, Micah, a prophet for turbulent times. Things in Micah's day were bad, but they were also good at the same time. They were good economically, to do with the economy and all those sorts of things, but they were bad morally. If they'd had news channels in those days, they would have spent half their time telling you that the economy was up, but the other half telling you that violent crime and murder was also up. That people were getting rich, but also that fraud and corruption was making other people poor. Economically, things were good, but morally, things were bad. They turned away from God, and the moral fabric of the country had begun to collapse. No holy God, no need for holy behaviour. Just look out for yourself, look out for number one, was the sort of mantra of the day. And we live in similar times in many ways. Now, I don't want to be melodramatic. I don't think that we are in the worst times our country has ever been in. Christians aren't being burnt at the stake like during the days of Latimer and Ridley or being thrown in prison like the days of John Bunyan. There's less violent crime in our country than there was a number of years ago and certainly less than the days of highwaymen and no police force. Even the young people of today, the teenagers of today, are supposed to be the most clean limit living in living memory. Less drunkenness, less drugs, less casual hookups, and that's not just because they can't go outside. That doesn't mean, though, that things are okay. The cleanest pig in the pigsty is still a pig, and the least smelly French cheese in your fridge will still stink your whole fridge out. Micah is going to shine a light on the state of the city that he lives in, Jerusalem. He does sort of two rounds uh, of going at it with crime, punishment, Micah's response. Crime, punishment, Micah's response. The first one is in verses 9 of chapter 6 to the first verse of chapter 7, and then the second is the rest of chapter 7. The people may think that things are okay, but things are bad. And God is going to make things even worse as he judges them for the bad things that they're doing. And we'll see in Micah's response how to react when things around us just seem to be falling apart. So first of all, we see that things are bad. We get five areas highlighted to show us how bad, bad things are in Micah's Jerusalem between these two rounds uh, that I mentioned before. We have scams, lies, violence, corruption and betrayal. So first of all, oh, sorry, <laughs> first of all, uh, we're going to um, look at scams and you'll notice that there are some similarities between Micah's day and our own. Firstly, scams. Have a look at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 6. Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scamp measure that is accursed? Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? In Micah's Jerusalem, it would seem that scams were all over the place. As I've mentioned before, Micah's days were quite affluent. There was money flowing around, but some people were not making their money honestly. They were scamming each other. In those days, trade, shopping depended on scales. Everything was like those self-service checkouts at the supermarket, except someone else weighed them and they had the scales. It seems it was common practice for traders to have one set of scales to weigh what you were giving them, and another set of scales for what they were giving you. If you think about it in terms of those self-service checkouts, imagine if it turned out that those machines were rigged to add extra weight to your bananas and carrots, and then the change that you received back on your bank card, they sort of took an extra percentage from what they were telling you. Could you imagine the outrage if it turned out that the supermarkets were doing that? Well, that's what the tradesmen in Micah's day were doing, fleecing their own people out of money. And it's not on posh things, rich things like caviar and champagne that they're rigging. It's not those things, it's everything. And whenever that happens, the poor always lose out more. Those who can't travel to other parts of the city for other shops those who will lose money buying basics like bread and vegetables. For them, losing a few pounds may be missing a meal. In the days we live in, I'm always saddened when I get those scam calls and emails telling me that my bank account is locked out 
or telling me that my internet is broken or that I've won a huge prize on some lottery. I'm saddened because I know that somebody is falling for those scams or the scammers wouldn't bother. And I know that the people who are falling for them are likely to be those who are vulnerable. These people prey on the weak, all to make a quick book. It makes me sad and it makes me cross. And we know that these scams are daily, aren't we? Some people get calls two or three times a day. We live in a society now where this is just normal, don't we? We've had to learn to distrust people who call us up on the phone. And that's sad, isn't it? It links with the other crimes that Micah highlights. So we had scams, but we also have lies. Look at, uh, um, with me, at uh, verse 12. Your rich men are full of violence and your inhabitants speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Lying has become the norm. It doesn't single out one group, it's everyone who's lying to each other. It's not just the scammers who are lying, but just everyday folk who have made lying the culture of the day. Again, our times are not that dissimilar. We live in the age of fake news and of alternative facts, where we almost expect our politicians to lie and are surprised when they actually do what they say. Where people make up stuff about vaccinations and pass it off as truth. Oh, Bill Gates is going to microchip you. Oh, there's no pandemic. It's all a conspiracy. Somebody's starting those lies, aren't they, somewhere? We live in an age where bending the truth on your CV is commended to get ahead. Where hiding the truth is okay as long as nobody asks about it. Think back to the horse meat scandal of a few years ago. Even in churches, lying in certain areas has become the norm. I'm always surprised and shocked when uh, people are thinking of moving churches and they decide not to talk to their church leaders, but instead to lie to them. I've noticed that it seems to be this sort of weird blind spot where Christians across the country think it's okay to lie in those circumstances. I met it frequently as a student worker. No, I, I was just busy last weekend. No, no I just slept in when actually they were trying out other churches. And instead of just coming out and saying it, they would outright lie in a way that they completely would not lie in other areas of their life. It's this bizarre sort of blind spot, one that we need to be aware of. If you don't think you should be doing something, then don't do it. Don't do it and then lie about it. It's just bizarre, isn't it? We need to be careful that we don't imbibe this lying culture as Micah's people had. So there was scams, there was lies, and then there's violence, that first part of verse 12. Your rich men are full of violence. He mentions specifically rich people who are doing violence. So often through history, money, lies and violence have gone hand in hand. Think of different versions of the mafia and mobsters that we've had down through history. And even worse, when they end up being those in power, the Robert Mugabe's and the Mussolini's of history the King John's and the King Charles's, pay up or the mob will come and get you. We don't know the exact nature of this violence here, but it's explained further in the next round in chapter 7 verse 2. The godly has perished from the earth. There is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood and each hunts the other with a net. There are traps set against people. There are people being kidnapped, perhaps for extortion, perhaps for what we'd call now people trafficking. There's a dark underworld to this Jerusalem of Micah's day, summed up in verse 16 as the statutes of Omri, the works of the house of Ahab. Omri and Ahab were such mobster kings of the northern kingdom of Israel with their violence and thugs who murdered prophets and took whatever they pleased. This was the state of the day. He was saying this is now the norm for you. But even today, we're not strangers to state-sanctioned violence and killing. Every year, over 200,000 abortions are performed in the UK, with less than 2% of those for health issues with the mother or the baby. That's, that's a population that's larger than the city of York every single year. I don't want to be too graphic because I know that there are children listening, but what is going on is truly shocking if you think about it, and it's deemed as okay by the state. Or what about what's going on over the world to Christians in other countries? 
Even the most conservative numbers from people like the BBC reckon that there are tens of thousands of Christians killed, killed each year for their faith. And that's the ones who are killed, let alone the violence that is faced by Christians in countries like North Korea, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and Sudan. And yet how much of that do you hear on the news? How much has that been an issue uh, in the trade agreement negotiations with other countries? And of course, it's not just Christians who face violence across the world. We should be standing up for other groups facing violence too. Women, ethnic minorities, homosexuals, Muslims, Jews. No group should be facing violence and murder, should they? That's not right in any circumstances. They don't have to be Christians for us to be upset about them facing violence and persecution. Micah doesn't specify that it was believers facing violence. He was just shocked and saddened by the pervasive violence in his world. So scams, lies, violence and corruption. Have a look at uh, verse 3 of chapter 2, of chapter 7, sorry. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. And the prince and the judge act for a bribe. And the great man utters his evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. Last week we mentioned that the people tried to bribe God, the judge of mankind. Here we see a bit why. The judges in Micah's day did take bribes. Leaders, great men, would tell them what they wanted and the judges would see it done. They were in cahoots, they weaved it together, as Micah puts it. Even the best of this evil of these great men is like a thorn bush, dangerous and damaging. And this corruption still exists in our world, doesn't it? We read about firms and politicians taking backhanders. We still know that often it's uh, who you know that counts. The former president of France was arrested last week for corruption. He's going to be put in prison. A previous president in France only escaped prison for corruption while he was uh, uh, when I was in France because he was head of state while his friends were charged and put in prison. And that's France. France is not exactly a failed state, is it? It's next door. Anyone else remember the cash for questions scandal I grew up with in the newspapers? Corruption hasn't gone away. Even churches have had their fair share of financial irregularities over the years, haven't they? Corruption is still pervasive in our society too. His final charge, though, is betrayal. Have a look at verses 5 and 6 of chapter 7. Put no trust in a neighbour. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. The outcome of all these lies and violence and, and corruption is that when disaster strikes, there's no one you can trust. Even normally loyal institutions such as the family are full of betrayals and strife. The time is coming when even those closest to you cannot be trusted, says Micah. There's no loyalty here. When the day of trouble comes, it's every man and woman for themselves. Jesus quotes this passage in the New Testament to warn his disciples of what it will be like for them as they follow him. In Matthew 10, 34, he says this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. There Jesus is warning them that following him will potentially turn their families against them. That often there'll be no loyalty, even when it comes to family, when it comes to be, uh, becoming a follower of Jesus. You think that sounds extreme, but I can tell you of countless cases where people have been welcomed into God's family, only to be rejected by their own. And it's not just something that happens where you'd expect. We have cases even in our church family where that's happened. It's not something that's impossible or extreme. In some senses, we live in that day of trouble now. That's what Jesus is talking about, isn't it? 
But a society like the one Micah describes here cannot go on forever. Either it will destroy itself or God will step in. Well, God here chooses to step in, which brings us to our second section. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. God promises them just punishment for their crimes. The appointed rod has arrived from verse 1. Exile is coming, says God. I'm kicking you out. He'll make them desolate. He'll make them a desolation and their inhabitants something that people hiss at, something that people will not like, they'll stay away from. And as though uh, a sort of poetic justice, it's as though God says, you wanted to break the market in your favour? Well, I'll break the market against you. When you go into exile, you'll eat, but you'll never have enough to eat. You'll save money, but it will be taken from you. You'll sow, but others will take your crops. You'll tread grapes and olives, but it'll be for someone else. These things that it describes here in our passage uh, as the judgments that God will bring in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6. They're the things that would happen in Leviticus 16 that God said would happen if they abandoned him. But it's the very things that they had used to cheat people that God uses in judgment against them. God will frustrate their markets and their money and bring disaster to them. Frustration and futility now take the place of blessing. And now even their economic good news has gone. But it gets even worse. Have a look at chapter 7, verse 4, the second half. The day of your watchman, of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. He calls it there the day of your watchman. Watchman is one of those words the prophets use for themselves, or at least God used it of them in the prophets. Watchmen were the people in society uh, who were supposed to warn of upcoming danger. They would sort of stand on the high places of the city and look out and see what was happening. This is exactly what the prophets were supposed to do, and indeed had been doing. They'd been warning the people of this up and coming judgment for years. But the people on the whole had ignored them. Well now, says Micah, the day of the watchman, the day the watchman had warned of, has now come. There's no turning back. The day of confusion, the day of trouble is coming. What's going to happen? Well, God is going to show up. The phrase we have there in verse 4, the day of your punishment, well, it can mean that, but the more normal meaning is the day of your visitation. The day when God pays a visit. And of course there's truth to both. When God shows up, there's going to be trouble. It's like a game my boys play on the, the Wii console called Raving Rabbids. One of the mini games there is set in a classroom where there's loads of kids messing about. If the teacher turns up and catches them messing about, then he throws a board rubber at them. I'm sure the teachers in our church would vouch that it's not normal teaching practice anymore. <laughs> But Israel had been messing up big style, and now the teacher is coming. It's the day of their visitation. Now this probably refers firstly to their exile to Babylon, which came a generation or so later. But Jesus seems to refer to this in Luke 19 as he weeps over the city of Jerusalem, the very city that Micah is talking about. In Luke 19, 41 to 44, he says this, and when he drew near, and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known of th on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when you, your enemies will set up against you a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is saying to them, you didn't recognise when the teacher showed up and now there's going to be trouble. And Jerusalem felt a foretaste of this in 70 AD when it was raised to the ground by the Roman army. But how do we respond as we see this terrible drama unfold in our world? Well, Micah models two ways we are to respond to a decaying world under God's judgment. The responses are woefulness 
and wakefulness. Micah gives these two personal responses as he speaks out against these things. The first response is woefulness. Have a look at chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Woe is me, for I have become a summer fruit, as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright from mankind. His response is, woe is me. He despairs of what is going on in his land. It makes him sad. He's mentioned that the people have been doing the works of Ahab, and he feels like Elijah, who was around in those days. I'm the only one left. The godly has perished from the earth. I'm like the last grape on the vine, the last fig on the tree. Now, this is obviously an exaggeration. He was around at the same time as Isaiah, so there was at least one other person standing for God. But this is how he feels, alone and woeful. It feels like he's the only one who has a problem with how things are. He feels very much in the minority. The rest of the country are running headlong into this and no one else seems to see it. And we know that feeling too, don't we, I think? We feel in the minority. Being a Christian in our context can feel very much like being a fish trying to swim upstream. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4 verse 4 that the world are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. We don't want to join in and that makes us the party poopers. What makes others celebrate makes us sad and they just don't understand it. Even within the wider church, we can feel a minority. Why don't other parts of the church seem to have a problem with this? Why is it always us who have to speak up about moral issues? Why don't the other parts seem to pull their weight? It makes us sad, doesn't it? Woe is me. Not just about the nation, but about the church. And if we really are the only ones, then woe is me for our world. Because we are not innocent in these matters either, are we? We condemn lying, but do we lie? Yes, we do. We mentioned some of the ways earlier. We condemn betrayal, but are we always faithful? No, we're not, if we're being honest. We condemn violence, but do we speak up for the unborn? Do we speak up for our brothers and sisters facing violence across the world and others as well? Probably not, not in the way that we should. If it were down to us, then the world would be in big trouble. But it's not. And Micah knows this too, because his other response, apart from woefulness, is wakefulness. Have a look at verse at 7 of chapter 7. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Okay, so wakefulness is not a word, but it should be. As he looks on his country soaked in sin, facing impending exile, he looks to the Lord. He waits for God. He knows that he cannot solve all the world's problems. He knows that it's not all down to him. So he waits for the Lord. He trusts that the Lord has it in hand. And boy, that must be a big weight off his shoulders. No pun intended with weights there. Sometimes as we look at our broken world, there's a temptation to think that it's all down to us to fix it, to stop the sin, to stop the moral decay. But it isn't. We don't join in with it. We don't applaud it. We can warn other people as Micah did, but we understand that we are not God. We are not the solution. Micah looks to the Lord to sort this. He prays to the Lord to sort this. We know that he prays because he says that God will hear him. He must be praying for his broken world. But sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that we are the world's sin police, that it's our job to go and stop society sinning. Now, of course, we should be an influence for good where we can. Of course, if we can, we bring about social reforms for the good of people. Evangelicals have a great history of doing such things down through the years. 
But we know those things will not fix our world. They will not fix the real problem that people have. The reason it was so bad in Jerusalem was that the people had turned away from the Lord. The violence, lies and betrayal were just symptoms of that. They needed to turn back to God, not just turn over a new leaf. They needed a living relationship with the living God, not a list of rules and a pep talk. What they really needed was the gospel. And Micah knows this. He's experienced that living relationship with God himself. He calls him my God. Now there are many names for God in the Bible. Lord of hosts, El Shaddai, I am who I am. But this is the one that counts when it really comes down to it in a way for us. Micah says God is my God. Can you say that of God? He is my God. Have you got that living relationship with God through Christ? Micah trusts him to deal with the situation because he knows God. He has a living relationship with him. And he calls God the God of my salvation. Not only does he know God, but he has experienced this rescue from sin and judgment himself. It's not like Micah sits aloof from the problem. He knows that he's been part of it. He knows that he has done the things that he's condemning. But God has rescued him. And he knows that the people need that same rescue that he has had. He knows that that is their only hope. As we said last week, they need to throw themselves on the mercy of the judge. Because the, their crimes, as he's explained it, are clear. So he trusts the God of his salvation with the situation. He prays to and looks to the God who saves. He waits for God to act. And next week we'll see that his hopefulness and wakefulness is not wasted. God is going to do something about this. And we too should share that response of woefulness and yet wakefulness as we see our turbulent times. When things get bad and things get worse, what do we do? Well, we look to the God of our salvation, woeful yet wakeful, praying for our world, not imagining that we can fix it, but looking to him and waiting for him. So let's pray that in the weeks and months to come as we face uncertainty in our world, that God would give us the strength to do that, to have that sadness for our world as we see things going wrong, but also to look to him, the true one who can fix it and the true one who gives us strength in the meanwhile. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that even though we are woeful about our world, Father, we know that there is so much wrong. We know there's so much wrong within ourselves, Father. We thank you that we can be wakeful too. We can look to you and we can hope in you, the God of our salvation, of my salvation. Father, we thank you for that rescue that comes in Jesus. Thank you that even though we've spoken lots about judgment this morning, Father, thank you that the rescue comes through him that he is that merciful judge who, if we turn to him, will forgive us and welcome us into that living relationship with him. Father, we pray that we'd remember that in the days and weeks to come. In Jesus' name. Amen.